Okay, let us get started. Big, big day today. Um, I haven't been streaming for a long time and I feel like you guys are owed an explanation. I am very, very sick. I've gone down the rabbit hole of illness and I haven't been able to climb back up. I'm not sure why this time I haven't sprung back. I usually spring right back. Um, but spring, it seems, is <laughs> taking its sweet time and I uh, have not been doing well. And I really don't know if this Thursday I'll have a class. I don't know if I'll take a break again next week. I don't know. I'm hoping that I don't have to. I'm hoping with all my heart that I don't have to cancel ever again. Um, but, uh, but if I do, I'm sorry. I have a lot of brain fog at the moment, um, and a lot of trouble remembering words, a lot of trouble completing sentences, um, really slow, and I don't know if I'll be a good teacher today. I'm, my faith in myself is a little bit, no, a lot of bit, um, challenged. I have a flu, I think, again because I took a medicine that um, completely disabled my thyroid medication and my body temperature dropped and because of that I got another flu or cold and I've been fighting it for about a week now. Um, so I'm going to try to do today's class as much, as much as I can. I will try to do everyone's piece today. I will take the time to read the brief, uh, to look at everyone's piece, to talk about whether or not it reads as a villain talk about the value of character design being able to uh, generate a read just from the external um, combination of visual elements uh, so without needing a story you, you we can definitely tell that it's a villain that is extremely important uh, so we'll be talking about portraying as much um, cues as possible uh, portraying as much with the cues as possible um, and uh, before I get started on all of that, thank you everyone for coming to the recordings. I really appreciate when you guys are here. Sorry, for the streams. I always do that. I really appreciate when you guys show up for the streams, and that's one, one really, really important thing that keeps me motivated. If I know that I'm going to be disappointing a hundred people, <laughs> I will not cancel, even if I have to push myself a bit. And you can trust that I'm not going to push myself to the edge, but if I know that I'm going to be you know, if, if 100 people are waiting for me, if 200 people are waiting for me, I'm going to show up. Um, when I see the viewer count go down on my stream, it's really demotivating. Um, mostly because some people take advantage of the fact that it is recorded later. Uh, but this is a class. This is a class. The recordings are a luxury. But the class itself, the reason why I host it as a live stream, is because it keeps all of us accountable to show up to a class, to take our art seriously, it's time to study, it's not, oh, there's a recording waiting for me whenever I feel like drawing again. No, the class is on and you show up to it. And it's like a real class at a real university because this is a real class. Um, I give all of my effort, all of my knowledge, and I'm climbing a very steep climb and it means the world to me when you guys show up for the stream. Um, it means the world. So if you guys can tweet it, YouTube no longer automatically sends out tweets or posts on Facebook. So I have to do it manually, um, which is adding even more tasks for me to do in the day. Uh, so if you guys can distribute the information, tell everyone that the, the live stream is now on, the class is now on. I really appreciate it. Oh, it goes a long way, I promise you. Um, I have a couple of announcements before we get into looking at these beautiful pieces. And I cannot believe how well you guys did, um, considering how slow the start of this year has been and the first five, four months of this year have been really weird for a lot of people. But some of you posted work anyways, and I, and I, I commend all of you for that. Beautiful, beautiful, completely finished illustrations here today. Nothing half-assed, nothing half-done. I really appreciate the effort. But yes, Portrait Studio is going to be on sale the 1st of June, starting May 31st, in the, uh, 1 a.m. Um, and it'll go on to the 14th of June 2019. This is the first sale of this year. It comes uh, as a celebration for our overhaul update that Abu is working day and night on and it will be uh, released around that sale time. The sale uh, will probably be hosted before the update is released and the update will raise the price. This always has been the way um, the price goes up because we invest more in Porsche Studio 
and the price goes up for Portrait Studio. The price will go up to $85 US, I believe. Um, we might we, we might still have a discussion on the, 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 the raised price and how high it's going to go up, uh, but it will go up. So if you are interested in owning a copy of Portrait Studio, this is one of the only sales we'll have this year. We do have a couple towards December and the season because everyone likes to give. Um, but uh, this is one of the only sales for the summer and the fall and it will be uh, for two weeks at 50% off so 50% off $85 um, if you can't afford the current price uh, you might want to wait for the sale if you can it's a support for us either way um, uh, then the next community challenge so the com current community challenge is today we're looking at it today the villain design is today the next one is going to be just as just as high octane as as the rest of them and we're going to that doesn't even make any sense i don't even know if i use that right high octane low octane um and we are going to have a poll topic poll discussion really back and forth i want to see people replying to each other i want to see people talking to each other what do the what do you guys want to do as a community challenge if, if the one of the topics is i want us to have to decide everything and write us another full narrative like the ancient weapon design um, then I'll do that, but I just want to know that everyone's on board. A lot of people, though we have a lot of submissions for the ancient um, weapon design, we had about 35, 40 submissions, I think we hit 50, 35 I looked at, and then 20 uh, tapering, which is a lot of submissions, a lot of people painting for one topic. Um, so I want to go even further than that, I want to see people, I want to see 100 people joining. If you haven't joined Reddit yet, that Reddit is where everything happens. Reddit is where announcements for the sale will go up. Promo codes, the topic discussion for the current challenge, submitting your challenge, submitting all kinds of stuff to be viewed in uh, regular critique hours. Hopefully they go back into the, into regular streaming and I'm no longer a weakling. Um, so everything is running from Reddit. If you have not joined Reddit, please join it. If you are looking for the Google community, it's gone. It's history. It's gone. It's in the dust. It's turned into dust. And this is the only place we run from. Okay, and then finally, Patreon. If you guys are interested in helping me out on Patreon, I really appreciate it. Um, uh, I've never take on, taken on any sponsorships. I've never taken on any kind of uh, 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 promotions or anything like that. I've always just run on independently. Um, so if you guys want to support, uh, not only will you be supporting, but you get something back. You get a Discord class. Um, we run everything through there as well. Um, it's a private little Discord community uh, for all of my apprentices. Uh, for any of the lower tiers, you still get ed educational material. For the um, initiate tier, you do get all of my personal work. And uh, you get a time lapse of all of my personal work along with my commentary, so how I did it. This is exclusive only to patrons. Uh, so you do get stuff back, you get brushes, you get the PSD files, you get a bunch of other resources that I have, whatever I've used to complete my personal work throughout the year, which I hope goes up in quantity and quality very soon, um, God willing, if my health um, keeps up. And, uh, and that's it. Let's read the villain design brief. Thank you everyone for being patient through the, through the announcements. I really appreciate when you guys sit through them. <clears throat> so, the theme of this month's challenge is the villain. You are required to complete an illustration in full color featuring a villain of your design. So the one we did last, uh, two years ago, was just a villain. So, so, well, it was an option. It was a villain against the gray background or, or an illustration, but this one is a full illustration. Um, and it must be submitted to the community challenge category. Of course, designing a character is not just in painting a face and a figure and throwing on some costumes. Really high-end character design manages to sync all of the units of the design together. It's a matter of relating to the character's backstory and pulling inspiration from their story for their entire design. So you have to learn how to be a writer for you to design, for you to design decent characters. There's, there's no way around that. This means it is required for you to complete the narrative first before starting drafting of any kind. Relating to a character's story will help you make more concrete design choices that reinforce and sync all components of the character's design, such as weapon choice, expression, portrait, face paint or scarring, hairstyle, hair color, clothing choice, and as it is affected by habitat or surrounding climate. So you're not choosing the color red just because it happens to look good and you have a taste for it. You're choosing it because you have a real design purpose behind it. And of course, that's always reinforced by a, a great narrative. 
It is very difficult to understand a villain's design without first seeing how they contrast with their natural enemy, the protagonist, or the good guy. How do they contrast the protagonist as the leading villain? So you get more of a three-dimensional villain when you think about their general role. Have they had a, do they have a good side to them? Do they have a regretful side to them? Do they have a part of them that's constantly fighting? So think of Gollum, probably the most dangerous character in all of Lord of the Rings, uh, but as well had a beautiful backstory and they are just so likable and so lovable, all at the same time being so incredibly evil based off just a really, really simple um, Cain and Abel kind of uh, a, a biblical brother kills brother type type uh, backstory. Um, but they, but the, of course, the, uh, Tolkien managed to cr give him so much more dimension by making him almost like a puppy at times. So that's really, really amazing writing, and that's the kind of stuff I want to see out of you guys. So are they the trickster, the overlord, the insurgent, the conspirator, the warrior? Um, and that, that, of course, makes the, uh, the choices for costume and weaponry very different. Um, so the some of the pieces that I showed you guys here to be inspired from different kinds of villains across movies. So you got the Scar, which is an amazing villain. You got Tai Lung, you got the Joker, you got Ursula, Voldemort. Um, no, not Doomsday. His name is not Armageddon. God damn it, I know his name, Apocalypse. Um, you've got, damn it, I forgot her name, B Bitch. Her name is Bitch. You've got Anton Chigurh. You've got, I think, Dr. Giro. I'm not sure. You've got Electro. Um, you've got Hades. you got the witch from, uh, him. Fucking sticky fingers. Stick, little finger. <laughs> you've got, um, Megatron. you got the Nazgul. You've got Pitch from Rise of the Guardians. You've got, uh, Prince Nuwada. All of these guys believed their cause was noble. Every last one of them. That's what I love about the villain is that they are so amazing to write because they are the perfect representation of the human struggle. Like they, their vanities and their pride, all the things that are born out of fear and mortality. So nearly all of these guys are chasing immortality. Literally all of them have that one thing in common. They're chasing power and immortality, but they're like the weakest out of all of them and they always get defeated. So that's the lesson, the great epic since the dawn of time, good versus evil, evil will lose, evil is vain and materialistic, good is um, community driven and loving. So, you know, every one of these guys is, is tied together by that. But at the same time, they do have their weaknesses. Um, so he wasn't that, I wouldn't say Sticky Fingers was that much of, a, of an amazing three-dimensional villain, but the expression is really what I want you guys to reference, how he managed to get that um, really, really sly, uh, sly uh, expression that makes it so difficult to trust him. He's a very, very one-dimensional villain, very, very cartoony, very childlike, but I like the way that his design was made to look sharp and dangerous. Lot, lots and lots of triangle use, sharp edges made to look like he is not safe stay away from this dangerous rock angry rock um here uh this goes back to some of the basic units of designing a villain which has everything to do with facial expression making them look as dead as possible so a villain is closer to death ironically even though they are striving for the most life they are always represented with the face of the skull um so just think skull so distorted nose asymmetry um, dried up lips, uh, dark circles, no eyebrows. Basically, you're think, thinking about, and I'm not joking here, it's not funny, a cancer patient, chemotherapy patient, someone who's completely losing life. It's really upsetting. It's really, uh, it really scares people to look at something like that, someone who is so void of life and vitality. Um, and then at the same time, you're thinking about older faces, really, really old people also missing that vitality. So it's sad to think about, but as artists, you have to know what these design um, units can, can, what power they hold um, in your ability, or what, what they will give you in your ability to, to pull off a believable villain. So this one is the face is gone completely. So lack of trust in our part when we don't see a character's eyes, when the white of their eyes is gone, when they are gone completely. See that? Um, we just trust them less. Here, this is more of a children's story, but also missing eyebrows, um, the, the, the kind of deathly coloring on the skin, missing eyebrows, dark circles, dark lips. It's just, it's really dark circles in the eyes and no whites in the eyes. Really, really difficult to trust. Um, and the thin lip, the sharp triangles in the, in the design. So all of that, I forget what his name is, that's Sauron. Um, I forget what his name is. Oh, what is his name? 
the Tang Shao Pass, the, the northern border, Mulan. Come on, the name is going to come up. No, it's gone. Um, so this is the kind of stuff I'm, th I'm looking at. Even Hades, no eyebrows, dark circles, no eyebrows. So it's not really a coincidence. No eyebrows, no eyebrows. Dark circles around the eyes looks very sickly. His mouth almost looks like it's drooling blood or it looks like his mouth is black. I'm very sure they gave this, dye this guy mouth dye to gargle before every scene just to make him look more angry. This one is more akin to sticky fingers because, um, I forget her name, but she, Azula, but she's got that expression, the smile and the angry eyebrows. So look, look for that. Um, Apocalypse also no eyebrows, dark circles, no nose at all, no eyebrows, dark circles, <laughs> expression, dark circles, skeletal, there's eyebrows, but the makeup really distorts it. Expression, full power, my favorite villain of all time and then dark circles. Uh, so it's really, really simple principles, but the thing that makes it unique every time that you design it is the, um, you know, how, how, how are you writing the story? How are you making it so that we're more interested? Every movie I've ever watched, I've always rooted for the villain. I don't know why. Because they just are so much more believable. They're honest about their desires. They're honest about um, their struggle. They're honest about what they want, whereas the protagonist is always, you know, back and forth, all self-righteous. The protagonist can be, it's very difficult to write a three-dimensional protagonist because being the good guy is very, very boring, um, very difficult to entertain with. The villain is so much more fun because it's so easy to pop a villain out and make them more three-dimensional by giving them a little bit of an internal struggle. And there you have it. It's fun to watch. Um, so if Sticky Fingers was just a little bit more good fighting his inner desires, then he would have been much more fun to watch. But he was pretty one-dimensional, all things considered, um, especially because he had so much power in Westeros. But that's aside. Let's take a look at these wonderful villains that you guys have today. Let's start with... Um, I'm just going to see how they come up in the queue. <clears throat> Okay, so I didn't read the story for a lot of these because I didn't have time to read every single story, but I'll try my best to get through them all. So what we have here, um, the story is really for you. The story is for you. I'm going to imagine that these are book covers, and you're trying to sell the story um, with the book cover. Uh, so, and yes, a book is absolutely judged by its cover. There's no way around that. Anybody who says don't judge a book by its cover is not getting any jobs uh, so make sure that you guys are actually remembering that and you're right you're creating these illustrations to draw in as much attention as possible um, so what I'm seeing here is just a crazy wife so that's what I'm reading the, the dress the turtleneck kind of uh, uh, like a sort of um, reserved Christian family but but she's kind of a little bit crazy I don't understand the purple, I don't understand the color scheme, so remember I'm critiquing these also as general illustrations, not just as the character design. Um, I like how it's really pulling from that insidious type of uh, uh, like 50s haunted home, haunted family. Uh, what's not happening is I'm not getting the read of a female, I'm getting the read of a male in female clothing, which can be a bit of a just like it can create distortions it can um create the uncanny and that we've actually seen in insidious straight on um there was a character dressing as a woman um one thing i really want you to do is exaggerate the length of the body so you're trying to pull from that distorted sort of look and you just have a straight line but you have all this length she's taking up the entirety of the scene what i'm going to do is just give her a little bit of a gesture. All right, so I'm gonna to try to do this by keeping things symmetrical. So showing that kind of like high note violin kind of distortion in her body, it's gonna really help push this. And yes, it is a little bit exaggerated. It is a little bit abstract, adding this really, really strange distortion and contortion in the body. But the, what that's doing is it's making her look making us uncomfortable by looking at her and that's kind of the only thing you have left because she's not this fantastical creature she's not got magical power she's just a suicidal kind of um murderous homicidal um, monster type creature that you would actually see in a james wan movie or something like i forget how to say his name wan wang on wang all right so i'm just pushing her pelvis out a little bit, making her look more, just see how much more uncomfortable we feel looking at this. 
Another thing that can make this uncomfortable, so let's take a look at this before, before, after, before, after. So that distorted, kind of like screeching chalkboard sound is kind of what I'm getting by, by looking at that. I don't know why Photoshop has lost its goddamn mind. All right, so I'm pushing her towards the edge of the canvas. Again, uncomfortable framing, not so uncomfortable that it's an uncomfortable, um, okay, so apparently Photoshop's lost its mind. Um, I don't know what's going on. Uh, let's just move on. Um, so what was I saying? Uh, yeah, it's still, it's still a good composition where we placed her, but it's, it's just a bit more uncomfortable kind of power that she's demanding in the scene now compared to before. So I want her to have a little bit more length. Maybe the title can sit on the top right before, after. Another thing that we have here, uh, God damn it! I know what this is. This is the, the, um, this is the stupid ass driver. Okay, so I'm gonna finish this one and then I'm loading the others and restart Photoshop after I finish this one. Okay, so let me just see what I can do here. So the problem with the eyes here is that they do look crazy, but where you've placed the light, it's not really reading as crazy. They kind of look a little bit tame. For you to really make them read as crazy, read as out of control, okay, so it's completely thrown off the... Um, File, save as. Give me a second. I'm going to just save it as a PSD and just restart Photoshop. Oh, all right. <laughs> Sorry, this is really bad. I accidentally painted the purple blob? Seriously? I did that? <laughs> You're kidding me. Let me find the original and just get this done. I accidentally painted the purple blob. I'm sorry, my whole driver was just getting all fucked up. I'll I'll correct that. All right, where was I? We need to start making her eyes look a little bit more manic. So we added that craziness. Ignore the purple blob. <laughs> we're going to make her eyes look a little bit more crazy. And we're going to work along this uncomfortable lighting that we're seeing here um abu i don't i don't know what's going on i really don't know what's happening let's okay it seems to be working now that's okay let's go on so the white in the eyes towards the top when we see that all right so let me show you what makes eyes uncomfortable when there are no eyelids, eyes are uncomfortable because this is shock, fear, um, some kind of madness um, that makes the eyes open up farther than is comfortable for the eye. So we're always kind of partially opening our pupils and we are uh, casting shade off our eyelids. Cartooning and years of cartooning has built like a habit in our instinct, a visual instinct. So when a character is shocked, their eyes kind of close up just like that. Their, their, their pupils and iris shrink into little dots. But when they're normal characters, when they're happy, their eyes are the right size. They're scared, their eyes shrink up. It also exaggerates the outline around the eye. Um, so that adds to that dark circle around the villain eyes. And so if we go here, look at that shadow that you added. So you, I know you think there's a shadow coming off the eye socket, and there usually is, but the light is coming from above and it's creating this kind of, you can use it to create like a glazed look in the eyes. And after we created that uncomfortable effect to the canvas, we, uh, so that glaze, I'm, I'm kind of throwing it as a belt across the eye. We're now creating discomfort in the eye, as you can see. So sometimes it's not in the iris that we get the white. We get the white and the specular highlight sometimes around the iris. 
So what did what what was the major change? What 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 why did distorting the canvas like that help the character? Can anyone reiterate the fundamental that I messed around with when I changed her gesture? So because that's there, we're gonna pull from the other units of the villain. If you haven't had enough experience with the villain, I did have very old video um, from our first villain challenge together and I do go in depth on all of the kind of skeleton design facial portrait unit uh, like uh, units to use when designing a villain and these are universal these are used in cinema these are used in cartooning these are used in comic books these are universal ways of making a character or a person or anything look scary all right. One thing you don't want to do is bring in the light in the eyes, which is getting a white and putting it there. It might make her look a little bit friendly. If you want to create that a glazed look, it'll have to be a little bit less of a sparkly happiness and more of a really long, distorted, kind of like pasty look to the eyes. Makes them look a little bit more scary. So it almost looks like tears. I would be careful with those. And then we have the dark circles. So you are missing a couple of the fundamentals that create contrast, necessary amount of contrast, because yeah, we messed with the composition, but we still need some focal point. So I'm just um, helping this along here. So before she looked like kind of an angry wife, after we want to make her look like that murder, suicide, potential, haunting, psychic comes in, insidious type of setup, and that's all really, really, really fun to write. I know it's all gruesome, but it really is. I feel like thriller movies are the most fun to watch because they really do engage in your deepest instincts to just get the hell out of your living room, but you still stay. So I'm adding that here, and that's because you're just, despite the fear factor, you're still incredibly curious where everything's moving, and that's really great movie making. And you get a chance to make your own little movie when you're designing your villain, and it's just so much fun. So the dark circles, that's what I'm adding in. And I'm looking for an answer. Made her more uncanny, made the proportions less familiar to the eye. Uh, more of a power stance. I would say the more pivotal reason why I changed it. What was the essential change I made? Distorting her face to a skinny uh, skeleton-like weird gesture. Eye-catching. Uncomfortable position. Perfect, Blendomatic. That's really the term I was looking for, uncomfortable. It created a distortion, almost like a sound effect distortion that you get when you get vertigo or, you know, that, that, that chalk sound, that kind of high-pitched violin they sometimes play when a character is looking down a hall and the hall is distorting into the cyclone or their distortion in their, in their vision or something like that. Now I need to uh, not make a boob of myself <laughs> and fix this color scheme here so I mean I don't know the purple's working because <laughs> it's a random color it's reminding me of insidious but I'm gonna try to um, no this is bullshit it's not gonna work uh, so before after so we added that and then I'm gonna try to finish this color fix I'm so sorry for that I have no idea how that happened <clears throat> my brush is out of control so before I'm just uh, using the color mode here another thing I'm gonna do is kind of point it to a specific era because in the brief I do talk about how it's important to kind of know what you're doing with the habitat or the design of the character or where they're from etc etc um, so I feel like she's one of those nuclear family wives, um, kind of like 50s, 60s, is about to kill her children. I know it's really scary. Or is about to kill her babysitter or something like that. Or back in the age where women were kind of like tra all treated as crazy. And so they end up actually becoming crazy. Because nobody's listening to them. Abu. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, so I'm just uh, correcting that and color, grabbing this and just making one last little change here. Forget the mirror, just ignore that. I will fix it later on. Beautiful job on the mirror edges though. I love this crisp edge on the mirror side. The reflection seems a little bit forced, um, but that's okay. All right. Now let's talk about the real winner here, the real winner, which is the light source. The light source is the chicken dinner of this illustration, and that is getting your light environment right. So after we figured out what we want to do with her, and this is all that gesture, st gesture stuff that I asked you guys to draft, what I'm doing now is establishing two kinds of light sources. One of them is the silhouette with her against the light of the living room, kind of like a nursery and she is just doing her thing. And what I'm going to do is delete her on the new layer. And look at that instant horror show. Especially that overuse of the soft brush really added to that dreamlike distortion of the scene. And the way you, I'm probably wondering, how do you know, you know, to use this? How do you know to distort the body? How do you know to make all of these changes? Well, you guys watch movies, don't you? And you guys watch all of these different um, genres. I hope you do anyway. That's where you, you're picking up all of this stuff. So one of the biggest things that makes you a good artist is just being more attentive to other art that's being made, learning from it, learning from it and adding it down, literally carrying around a notebook and making notes about what succeeds and what doesn't. You do need some edges, that soft brush though, it does create that dreamlike distortion. We do need some edges here. She is the focal point. This is one option for the light environment, completely darkening her and overwhelming the scene with more of that really really strong hazy afternoon light and then of course darkening her go i would go back and darken her that's one option um, i don't like this option because what it creates is too much light on the top right the one i like is the one you already had um, which means you're gonna have to decide against this um this uh light curtain that you have going on. There's a lot of light coming out of the curtain, so you might want to darken that. So this new layer that I used for the previous correction, I'm now using it to darken the entire scene. Okay, and what I'm going to do is get the same soft brush again. We're still going for that haziness, and I'm deleting only along her face, so I'm really exaggerating that open door, and I'm letting it distort around her body. Okay, so I feel like this one really creates more of that. You can hear the door creaking, you know. I like how you went for thriller. I like how you didn't go for typical heroic villain fighting an, an epic battle. I like how you went for this dark, twisted scene. And I, I really, really love playing with scenes like this. So... What's happening now is that I really want to exaggerate this intensity, so I might use color dodge on a white in a separate layer and just try to bring in some more strength in that light source. Okay, up against the curtain. Maybe her shadow is against that curtain. And we're moving down. <clears throat> so I was going to actually, before making this change, I was going to filter, liquefy, raise her skirt all the way up. And that's the 40s, 50s style kind of fashion. I don't want her shoulders to read as masculine. I still want her to read as feminine. Like, she probably is a very manipulative person. So she'll use her sexual wiles to get her way, or that's probably what she did with her husband. And the stories just keep writing themselves, you know. They, you just, they could be a million things she did. 
Maybe she haunts a house. Maybe she killed her whole family. God, I don't know. <laughs> it looks like she's capable of everything, this freaky lady. Um, I'm going to distort her head. And this distortion is starting to get, you know, reinforced by that highlight. And that distortion in her head, her head being twisted, makes her look like she's also twisted in the mind. You know, mind blown, right? And, uh... <laughs> And she's a little bit more crazy. One thing I really like to do is double expression for villains. So double expression is when we have crazy on one side, which is high arc, and desperate on another side, which is high inner. All right, so it's kind of half of her is screaming for help, half of her is demanding blood. Um, it just depends which side you want. So this could be the eyebrow that's hitting uh, that's hiding, sorry, that's being hidden, that's the eyebrow that could be asking for help. So this eyebrow could be the desperate one, this one could be the evil one. It just depends which side of her is winning and which side is losing. Okay, so you see how she looks a little bit sad, a little bit crazy? I don't like using that word, but it is what it is. These are the, 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 the terms we're using, and then this side I'm going to make a little bit more angry. And you can, you can change that around. You can make one half that is in the light, the crazy half, which is lower inner eyebrow, higher outer eyebrow. And this could be the desperate half that's losing. And just to make it more thrilling, let's make her peace, peaceful half lose and her evil half winning. All right. Oh, I think I messed it up. A quick bye. I'll go back to before I cleaned up the good half, let's say. Alright, those are my quick bye. I like her expression right now, but I, I do think she looks a little bit desperate on both eyebrows. So I want one of the eyebrows inner to be a little angrier. And then maybe this one not so angry. And this one could be the one that's going for it. And because now that we have this extra little light flooding in, we can make certain dark areas of the face illuminated by the spotlight. So the eyes could actually get even more light on them. And this part of the eye is really drowning in that light. Actually, I can only make this guess proper in the distance. Oh, my brush is not doing so good today. One thing you don't want to do for, I mean, you can. Blue eyes tend to create that evil. I'm sorry if you have blue eyes, but blue eyes are less warm, so they're really, really good for villains. Um, uh, they, they are so fun to dress up with red or purple eyeliner or eyeshadow and make them just look mad. And again, a lot of, if you haven't watched Insidious movies, please go watch them. They're really amazing. They teach you a lot about, you know, what's scary, what isn't. And one thing you don't want to do is try to force too much detail because even someone with blue eyes, from a distance, their eyes look dark. It's not that they, their eyes glow blue. So you're kind of humanizing her. And that's what we don't want to do right now. We don't want to humanize her too much. Sags in the eyes cast shadows down. And this kind of little area here might catch some light off that spotlight. Carried up radially. And then a little bit of age doesn't hurt, makes her look a little bit more crazy. And now we've managed to control all of our contrast and it doesn't hurt to get sharpen tool and just run that baby over all of your focal point. And then I would get Dodge Tool, but be very careful with Dodge Tool. Again, Dodge Tool is crazy, especially if coupled with uh, soft brush, because it gives you too much value too fast, and you're not really sure what you want to do with all, with all that, all that money. All right, and then I'm blurring this; it's too sharp. And then we have a problem, which is the general composition. What's happening with the entire picture? So, because we threw her up. We distort her. I mean, I would, if it was mean, I'm being very, very tame here. I would really distort her. Like, I would distort the entire scene. So 
something like that. Like I would, I would go for this and then I would darken one half corner going down. So I'm being very tame here with this change, but I just want to remind you that you do have a lot to work with. And then I would get the bucket, but gradient tool, get that black. Okay. And oopsie. And I would, let's see where I'm pulling the value from. So the, one of the part reasons this composition is so strong is because the light is towards the top. So I would darken the upper half and then I would darken the lower half, sorry, and I would darken the upper half as well. Just something so that we aren't working too much against the, um, at that window we're, we're, or against the light cracking through the door. We are still keeping that the focal point. That much light towards the lower half wasn't really doing much for you. And you can really see that you do benefit more by distorting her body and you really won't distort the right amount. You will be a chicken about it unless you zoom out. You have to zoom out for you to really make a proper guess how much you really need to distort her. Because it wasn't unless I zoomed out, it wasn't until I zoomed out that I, that I distorted her properly. All right, and look at what we're creating. We're creating a, a movement, this squiggly kind of, we can hear the violin playing on that spotlight as it travels up her body into her face. So the thing that carries this entire scene now is the composition. Um, I'm not so sure about how that breast is carrying the light. It's really kind of messing with my perspective here. Um, so it's not so much the reflection anymore, and it's not really a good reflection. You really weren't doing much with it. It's mostly to do with her face, the lighting, her expression, the directing, the filming. That is what's making her look like a villain. So if we look at the before, you'll see you really over-depended on that. Um, you really depended too much on that. Here, she looks like a really nice lady who some people think that she's evil, but I mean, obviously, if you look closer, you kind of see she's a bit angry. But what if this is her face? <laughs> what if she's a nice lady? And that's the thing. You hire artists and actors who are very normal people. What makes them villains on a TV screen? The makeup, the directing, the lighting, the environment around the character. And then finally, of course, we have clothing and costumes. So you shouldn't depend too much on the sparkles and the sparkles and the, and the, and the glitter that you just uh, scatter around the scene those are going to be the things that you leave to the end the big things are the lighting and the framing so now we really do see that she's just this villainous person up to something we've removed all of that shadow that made her look friendly above her eyes and really just created that haunting stare i'm just going to jump into filter Filter, sharpen, on sharp mask. So any questions about this about this setup here? What do you guys think about this? Any questions at all? So before, we distorted her body, corrected the lighting, darkened the room, really gave that spotlight that came through the door. I, I don't know if you really added that in there or if that's just me seeing it. Um, really making a difference. That light behind her, you were, you were kind of trying to benefit from two different light sources and that wasn't going to work. You have to have one dominant nature to the to the light source in the, in the area um her body looked a little bit masculine we kind of give her that feminine shape again and we we went for it her she got she has that crazy haircut let's distort her body a little bit more that thick neck made her look like a man so i brought that femininity back but of course the thing that carries it the most is the face and the expression therein <clears throat> Uh, the waving, I wouldn't say, hi Sean, I wouldn't say that she needs to wave. Someone's opening the door and she's about to get caught doing something and she turned around instantly. Or someone's seeing a vision of her, uh, a ghostly vision of her before she did what she did and she's trying to tell that person. Again, I'm getting lots of insidious vibes. She's trying to tell that person what she did. She's sort of showing off what she did. She's showing off. So I wouldn't say that a wave or any other gesture is needed. I think lighting is really what carries this scene. Thank you so much for critiquing this work. I'm going to rewatch this later and be on thankful. Thank you, thank you. Let's move on to the next one. I don't know if my tablet is still going to give me trouble. Filter. Um, okay. Photoshop has 
completely lost its mind today. I think it's Photoshop that's giving me trouble. All right, let's move on. So we've got the Rat King here. We've got a Thorn King over here. We've got, not a Rat King, a Rat Priest. Let's take a look at one that I don't really read very, oh, I'll leave those to the end. Let's take a look at another one that has a lot of lighting. Um, this one is very similar to a composition I worked on for that lady, that, that Gorgon. So I'll try to talk about that. Um, this one is more magic oriented, so lots of fantasy. So we'll talk about that. And then we've got masculine power here. So let's move on. <clears throat> the after is so much more iconic and just frightening. It looks like a, like a book cover. The after looks like a book cover of a, of a thing we watched a long time ago or something. Let's, t let's look at this. So lighting here is a little bit too giving. We're seeing too much. If you've ever watched an anime, every single character that the character, my protagonist, is about to fight was introduced as a dark, looming silhouette of mystery and danger. And this is not even my final form type of, uh, like, power. Like, they look like they're, or something always, some kind of measurement system is used to show that they are the most powerful thing the character has ever encountered, encountered thus far. And it's just, you know, it's, it's great stuff, though. It is great stuff because it does keep you hooked and it's really, really great for introducing these characters and, and making you more interested in the story. But we're looking at a queen in a throne room. She looks like she's... She looks, she looks, she looks too normal. Um, so my girl didn't have any legs to her, so it's kind of NSFW. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's the Gorgon. Um, let me see if I can find it. It's that Gorgon piece I did. Um, very, very similar positioning. I'm going to show it real quickly because there's boobs. Um, very, very quick right here. So leaning back, comfortable, comfortable in the throne, kind of relaxed. Uh, that's the gesture that you should have been practicing with. Not any girl sitting on a throne, kind of posing. This could be any person sitting on a throne, posing for their Instagram photo. They just went to, it's like they're posing with the Iron Throne or something like that. Like, they're just chilling. When we see a regal character, um, a character that is essentially really really proud of themselves we don't see them sitting with their legs together this this is someone who's won everything because one of her of her power her beauty but also her intelligence so she's not going to sit like like mommy told her to sit so that's a really really bad gesture on my kind of my opinion so one thing we can do um i want to try to do it is just take her arms and kind of just give her some kind of, you know what, I can't, I can't do it like that. I'm going to just erase the arms. <clears throat> so she is just a little bit too, I don't know what the word is, like petite, pretty, uh, normal. Um, she's a little bit not crazy enough. She, you tilted her head, which I'm really proud of you for. Good job. You tilted her head, you made her look crazy. But take a look at what tilting her head plus relaxed arms looks like. This lady's wearing straight up thorns. She's wearing two, she's wearing two blades. She's not going to sit all pretty. All right, so she's got her hands here. The reason why she looks petite is because the armrests are bigger than her arms. So I would let the armrests go down a little bit. She, the chair is too big for her. So to make her look big again, it's just to bring those armrests back down. Okay. So you've got hand, and I would go, because you, you saw my version, I would go for hand gestures, for something, maybe just um, sitting with a cup or a goblet of some kind and drinking, maybe moving or, or moving her, her drink around or something like that. Really anything to make her feel comfortable in her own throne room and comfortable in her power. She feels safe. She's one. 
or this is just her domain, this is her dominion. One thing that's bothering me about her design is that these thorns, these little blade shoulder pads are looking way, way too elementary. I really would want you to explore a little bit more. You have so much to explore with so many possible shape combinations for the silhouette, for the chest area, for the, for the, for the kind of the, the whole, I don't know what to call this shoulder pad com combined with neck thing, armor, plating. But you have so many shape, shapes to play with. So she's very proud of her sexuality, so that's fine, but make sure that the light is coming from above, so it's the top of the breasts that are getting the light, not the lower half. Okay, so we've messed around with that. What I would do is make one leg at least less pretty. So one leg can be on one side. And this isn't so much to kind of force a sexuality to her. It's just, I wouldn't sit like this if I was in my own throne, throne room. Like I would sit in a way that is comfortable for me because I am the queen and I get to do what I want. So at least a uh, sitting like, it's not so much to spread her legs or make her look sexy. It's mostly because she looked very uncomfortable. And that's what we're seeing first. We're seeing her legs first. So take a look over here now. She looks a lot more comfortable. And it explains that head tilt. That head tilt is a confident head tilt. All right, so what does that mean? It means the rest of her is also confident. And unless she's on, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Girls know where I was going with this. All right, so I'm just going to fix this here. Her, again, she looks a little bit small for her throne because her feet don't even reach the ground, such as what I deal with on a daily basis. Okay, so I'm just going to raise the stairs up, and then we're going to talk about, what is it again? The diva of all paintings, the light source. So I'm going to talk about that in a second. I'm just going to raise the, these stairs so that they're a little bit closer to her. Good job on the perspective of the stairs. I really like how you managed to make it look like we're actually climbing up on those stairs. Okay, so you've got symmetry, 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 symmetry. And if we go back to that painting, what I tried to do is break that symmetry. So I tried to bring in a light flooding from the top right. And there's really so much you can do with a scene in a throne room that is deliberately symmetrical. Because a throne room is usually symmetrical, even if it's a, 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 a crazy orc kind of bone and skull type of throne room setup aesthetic. We still have a bit of symmetry to it. So what I would do is bring in an asymmetrical uh, light to come in and flood in. What you want to do is find the dominant environment light source. So she, she's clearly the goddess of fire or something. And so what you want to do is start making sure that the general environment here is the red environment. And the light source could be the relief, the new color that we that we use. As for her face, everything looks great as a villain. She's definitely reading as a villain. I feel like you're kind of trying to do too much with her boobs, though. I feel like her boobs, her whole chest cavity is kind of, like, bloated. You, you, you'll still have boobs. You'll still have the boobs read just fine without that kind of exaggerated fullness because it's just making your work look cheesy. And there's like, you know, 80s style card art, cheesy. And then there's this, which is just a little bit too cheesy all around. You want to, yeah, add that sex appeal. A low v-neck still has sex appeal. Um, in some workplaces, v-necks aren't even allowed. They're just too, they're just too sexy. <laughs> all right? So remember that you don't need that much to make her look attractive. My school v-necks weren't allowed. And so I'm just pushing this here. All right, so a little less full, and then I'm just going to think about where the light source is coming from because now you've got two focal points. What I did with my peas when I drew my villain, and my villain obviously is a villain. She's a evil, like a Gorgon type of praise on men. So 
what I'm doing right now is just trying to reinforce the light that's coming from the top. And then I'll bring in the floodlight with a different color. But I'm just trying to show you, you really don't need that exaggerated, cheesy fullness to the breasts to make them look and act for the focal point. You only need so much. You need a little bit of a chest bone highlight somewhere in the middle. And that's really all that you need here. Okay, and so what we're doing now, I'm going to shrink her head because, again, her big head is making her look tiny. She kind of looks like a toddler. <laughs> so I'm just going to shrink her head, and that will enlarge her body, hence making her look like an older character. One thing you can do along with her tilting her head is tilting her head forward. Um, so that'll really make her, that's something I did as well. And again, this is just a recommendation for you. You don't have to copy everything I did, but these are just things I would do. Tilting her head forward means her nose is lengthened, her ears go up, and her eyes are brought down, and her chin decreases in length. So that made her head look a little bit more like it's tilting down. So take a look before, a bit big, shrunken, and then now it's kind of tilted down. So let's complete finally with these long cast shadows coming off the spotlight. Trying to make it so that the face is still part of the light environment. We have shadows coming in. So yes, I understand why you put your shadows where you put them because the light was symmetrical. But honestly, symmetrical light, symmetrical floodlight, Symmetrical throne room, symmetrical costume, symmetrical way of sitting. It's just too much symmetry. It's very, very boring. Okay. And then I'm going to throw a big shroud of black or darken. Just so that we're only getting light where we really need it. Everything else is secondary, non-important. And I'm erasing where we do have that light come in all of those important elements that carry the read of the focal point. So her arms are a bit off. Her whole body's a bit distorted for my taste. So I'm, I, would, I would work on making sure her body's symmetrical, but um, I mean uh, proportionate, but uh, I'm short on time at the moment. Okay, so she is very small in her scene. So I would try to kind of correct that. I mean, I don't know how important these rocks are in this empty space is. Unless you want to really make her look alone, I really would work on filling the scene up with a little bit more or just enlarging her character. Enlarging. Enlarging. And then um, illuminating the background just for some relief, not too much. And then finally... We have that floodlight coming in. I'm going to try to do this properly. And this is the color where you can really have fun. You can go for blue, blue floodlight. Um, I know that seems a little much, but when you actually bring it in, it'll look fantastic. Okay, see that two um, kind of combating color washes? And what you can do here is you can throw in a really, really nice glare on it on the stairs, wherever the spotlight hit the ground and get that super sexy glare. So this is a bit too basic an application. Of course, this is just for demonstration. I would work on choosing the right uh, layer mode. I would go back and see how much I can paint on the rest of the character. I would go back and delete areas that I don't want any blue to sit on. I would repaint the face, bring in a glow to the eyes, anything really. But her position, her gesture, her costume, and her face are all working really well. Her expression as well. Even though the scene is a little bit too small for us to even detect her expression, I really think um, she's supposed to be a voodoo queen. She looks like a, she looks like a straight-up emp empress. She looks like... She's not a voodoo queen. A voodoo queen would be someone who was connected to nature. I would believe that voodoo and nature are like hand in hand. Uh, so we were thinking of skull and bones type aesthetic. When we're talking about a fire, fire nation type throne room 
um, volcanic, underground, queen of the orcs, queen of the balrogs. I, I don't see voodoo queen. I don't see any bone structure. I don't see uh, any skeletalness to her. In her chest area, I see a, a warrior queen, a warrior empress. So you might want to rethink that title for voodoo queen. When you Google voodoo, if you see a, a, a fire nation, then I won't blame you. But if you Google Voodoo and you see bones and skulls and you ignored that, then again, that's really weak design on your part. So enlarge her character and bring in a different light source to create that really, really cool effect. It doesn't even have to be completely flooding her. It can be somewhat flooding her, just slightly on the stairs, not really even on her. And that still looks amazing. Right, because that extra blue just did so much for the scene, but it's obviously still about her. And then same thing with that... Um, getting that blue, I mean, getting that black and just throwing in shadow where just nothing is happening. And then I, I would, um, enlarge her. Oops. I would enlarge the scene a little bit just so we're picking up on her expression. And if there is something happening in the eye, some magical element, introduce it now. And it'd be really cool if you introduce it with some other kind of color, some new color, or or work on this scene. I wouldn't go for an ex uh, an expression or a gesture that isn't relaxed. Um, but I wouldn't be relaxing if I just brought in my worst enemy and he's at the base of my throne and begging for his life, I would show off, I wouldn't sit relaxed, but some, you can argue, sitting relaxed is a show of power, so it just goes back to, you know, what you think feels powerful. For this one, I really, really like this one, but what I'm seeing is a lot of kindness in the eyes, uh, so one of the reasons why this isn't reading as a villain is because of a bigger problem students deal with, which is way too large irises. When you're enlarging the iris, you're creating a friendly character. There's actual contacts people wear to make themselves more beautiful, and they are iris enlarging. They're just horrifying to look at. I mean, I don't know why people need to do that, but, you know, the human eye is just so beautiful on its own. It's just usually what I think, but... Not just that, you kind of also, the squint was in both upper and lower eyelids. You want to make someone look crazy. Squint the lower eyelid. Darken it as needed, because there, she didn't really have shadow. She had some great skin color here. She's been taking care of her skin. No, I would squint that. But I would unsquint the upper eyelid, because she's kind of lost her mind. She's entertained. And really, the reason why... Uh, villains smile so much is because they're entertained. They're entertaining themselves. Okay, and so that, I mean, you can make it a flooded blind eye, focus on the on, on her bait, or you can make it a black eye, but I would bring in a bit more activity in those eyes. So I'm enlarging the eyes upward. She's entertained. She's having fun. She's just like a second away from clapping her hands. I would give a bit more asymmetry to the eyes. More of an asymmetrical, crooked smile. A little bit of scorn, I would say. And another last little curl. See that? More asymmetry. The nose, you're kind of trying to make the nose do all the work for her. And yeah, she's a witch, but you're, you're borrowing really, really basic... Um, like kindergarten level description of a witch. You, you have more at your disposal than you think. The light is coming from beneath, so we've got that fireplace kind of lighting set up, can, which can really distort her. So I'm going to try to utilize all of that before I even touch the eyes again. <clears throat> so we've got the massive, massive browless brow bone. Not casting any shadows upward. That's a problem. That needs to go up. She's got a shadow there. Anywhere where we usually have a shadow, we now have a highlight. So we've got a shadow there. And this is all that shadow coming from the cauldron. We've got a shadow there. We usually have highlight on the top of the chin. Now we have shadow because the light has inverted. 
We have shadow on that dimple there on the chin. Lots of light under. We have usually a shadowed upper lip. Now it's lit. And we have an upper, upper lip area that is now getting a bunch of light. So you're, I don't know if it's a woman. Um, and then we've got the, um, the rest of the flooding of the light here just to make her look like she's lost in the darkness of the room. And then I would invert the eyeball shadow. Usually we've got light at the top, dark at the bottom. Now I'm inverting that. And going here. So one thing this uh, uh, artist here has that other people didn't have is a really, really great color wash. So the color wash here is just wonderful because we're really not fighting a lot but you do have a random little minor character the blue character here glowing of their own accord against this color wash which made bigger characters bigger than this character um kind of lose their uh color so he went monochromatic but they didn't because they're glowing but is their glow really stronger than the cauldron so i'm going to illuminate the cauldron a bit more and because of that the expansion of that glow oopsie so let's try that again oh jeez dodge tool dumbass and then we have a regular brush Throwing up more glare, more glow. My brushes are out of control today. All right, and then I'm going to erase along this edge. Create this cast shadow here. It's a great cast shadow you have on the chest. And then we've got the color wash. So. This character is glowing, so I would make them their feet a little bluer the higher up you move, but they'll still be taken over by this general color wash. So now that we corrected that, we see your character really didn't have much going on. So you can illuminate them to be a bit brighter. What, what happens when we're looking at the sun and there are stars on either side of the sun? Um, so when they try to observe the sun with a spectrograph or something like that. You can't see the other stars because they're so muted. Their color is complete. Their value is completely drowned out, being so adjacent to the sun. So I wouldn't. I I don't know what to say. I wouldn't. I wouldn't make the cauldron glow so much. But because you're so far in, uh, you have to now because you don't really have any nearby lamps, shining a top-down light on this character. This is you. You've committed to this, um, so this is your choice now. Um, I am not sure how I would save you from this thing, but you can still go for a blue-green glow, which might match. Try to find something adjacent. So let's see, this is a murky swamp green. So what you can do is bring in a general saturation everywhere. Shift that over into blue-green, which will really help the scene, because if you're gonna stay monochromatic, choose a good one, choose a good color to have consistently repeated throughout the illustration. So now that we have more saturation, we have more blue, and I can probably sneak in a blue-green on the character here and they'll look okay. <clears throat> so now they're glowing with a blue-green that's a little bit more friendly for the scene, but still not completely corrupting the color wash and then you've got the character the character shouldn't be completely drowned in the in the monochromatic value you should desaturate around them because they're not really that luminescent or reflective to reflect that much so I would desaturate them I would however bring in wherever we have some highlights so some drool I don't know maybe they're drooling they're ready to eat the fairy so they're drooling a bit. The teeth are catching some light. We've got some skin reflection. The nose is nice and oily. Mmm, delicious. 
and then we've got the eyes reflecting a lot so we've desaturated them we haven't let them stay super kind of monochromatic but we are still bringing textural changes which should help reinforce them as the focal point because at this moment the focal point is being fought against the um, fairy and the cauldron. A little bit of reflection here on the fabric of the hat. The hair feels very, very flat. Hair casts shadows on itself. So try to remember that. And then if you are bringing in a color and bring it, bring it in with a color layer or color mode that will help you kind of show some color on the body, the skin, the hair color without being completely monochromatic. I'm just going to cast a shadow off the nose a little bit. Kind of looks like my grade school bully. <laughs> and then getting rid of this. So now we can bring those pupils back in. But, of course, we've given everything else a chance, and so we're not depending too much on them. And I'm going to keep them small. Oops. This is going to be tricky. Ooh, that's nice. Making them look, like, completely derped out kind of makes them look crazy. See that? <laughs> well, that's, that's one way to do it, definitely. That was kind of accidental but I kind of want them to look like they're looking at their struggling prey. With the white of the eyes kind of there. Maybe looking down is also really cool. So you got derpy focus or looking down. You, you, you have a lot to work with. And then we're looking at the before. Kind of seems like they're mourning the... They, they, they kind of seem sad they're doing this. They're avoiding eye contact. And uh, after, a little bit more intense, a little bit more crazy. And villainous. I would exaggerate the darkness around the eyes a lot. I would definitely go for that. That'll really help them look a little bit more out of control. And then last minute touches from a distance, I would um, kind of just bring in that really strong upper glow. To make things more intense again. So just last little pushes to complete read so before kind of sad after they're having a lot of fun <laughs> okay roasting her grade school bully in front of almost 100 people <laughs> what if one eye was white you I mean go for it go for it have fun just don't do this don't make them look like a wise old grandma thinking about her past and her long lost love all right make her look like my high school <laughs> bully <laughs> Okay, I, I didn't erase the bottom parts of the eyes, which is probably not helping the squint come through. I should have erased that before I merged down. Alright, so you see that squint is a little more crazy. And remember that sheen, that glossy sheen sitting on top of the eyes? Um, you can try that as well. Uh, uh, or that we did with the crazy murder suicide cover. Um, you can uh, do it for this one as well. Gl the glare on the eye. And then we've got this one here, which kind of looks like just a wise old papa. You know, he really isn't reading as a villain. He kind of looks like a worried father. Um, so we have that masculine strength. I like the framing. I really like how he's standing in the scene. So let me just clean up your soft brush here because, ow, ow. 
Your use of soft brush is actually hurting me. You've let it completely distort the one focal point you had in the scene. Okay, you don't need that. You need the edges more than you need soft brush. Get those edges back. So I'll go back to before I did that. And then just delete where the mess is. You didn't have much working for you in this scene other than him. It's a pretty empty scene and you just threw a soft brush. You might as well just get an eraser. Soft brush has eraser powers to it. Write that back to me, please. Soft brush is an eraser. It's an oversized smudge tool. It is a killer of, ca of canvases. If you don't know how to use it, don't use it. So how do we make this dude look a little bit more like a villain? So he feels like he's towering over us. He's made this decision of some kind. He's, he's made a decision to possibly annihilate an entire species. So he looks like he's mad with power. So I want his chin to be very high. I want to see more of his nose. We're tilting his head up. He kind of looks like an overpowered religious leader. And I want him to look like he's not mad with power, but definitely with very little remorse. And I don't want a professional curiosity. I want him to look like he is capable of madness, or he's smart enough to have hidden his madness over the years. All right, so we're creating that elongated neckline. He isn't an athlete, so he is some kind of scholar or some kind of intelligent advisor. If he is a king, give him a bit of a stronger body. I would give him a, a bigger body just because male. Kind of like a Judge Frollo from uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. I'm going to give him a bit of racism. <laughs> he looks like he'd be a racist. So I'm giving him that scorn. That snobbery. I'm going to give him that older person's wrinkled lip. He still doesn't read as much. Uh, he's not detestable yet. He still has a bit of kindness in his eyes. I want to get rid of that. Maybe we can make him smile on one side. All right. So what we have here, and the, he's not dark enough still. He still needs to go much darker against that light background. You also have this pinkness going on in the scene, which can be very sickly, and I like that. I like that silk sickliness in the color. But something like this will really hit home because it, it'll it bring in that actual sickly color where before you had a pink sickly, I would give it, remember Umbridge, Professor Umbridge, is that what her name is? The pink bitch from Harry Potter. She had that sickly pink bleh, color, but it was an and in and out, one foot in, one foot out. She's weird, but not yet a villain. She will be a villain, but you know when she is, we'll know it, and that will be a plot carried um, read, not a, a visual read. But right now, all you have is this book cover. All you have is this cover or illustration. You want it to read. So go for sickly, sickly. Go for actual puke vomit color. Do you understand what I'm saying? So make it more of a familiar color color code. If you want to bring two different colors and you can make him one wash, you can make a character of the background another wash. You can try for different colors together just to see what they do for you. This is a really, really cool one. It makes him look more magical but also evil. Desaturating also helps create that evil, that dungeon kind of setup. So I don't think the color you show that you used um, really, didn't, really didn't carry anything for the scene. So this is not even the before yet. So 
Yeah, I do have a photographic memory. It's kind of fading, though, because I have dementia, I think. <laughs> so before, do you see how he um, looks like a kind of worried father after he looks like an asshole? Okay. Now, we still have more work to do. There's a problem with the eyes. So what we want to do is show enough light on the eyes that we're kind of doing something with them at least. If they're completely hidden, then the, the scene is completely empty. Okay, so see what we're, we're doing here? We're, we're, we're taking a bit of a, a liberty here with what we're allowing physically possible. Allowing to be physically possible, so we... Oh, shit, I put it in the wrong spot. She said. <laughs> Strax back, y'all. <laughs> um, so I'm just putting <laughs> and what you do now is up to you. You want to make the eyes glow. Go ahead. All right, so he looks like a non-magical villain. He definitely looks like a jerk. He looks like someone who might be good later, but it's definitely evil now. What else can we do? We can go ahead and make them black and just go for that full read. He's kind of looking at someone who's about to be executed, and he really is curious about how they feel, but he really couldn't care less about whether or not they're going to survive. He also looks like someone who's thinking. So this could be him thinking, maybe him shocked. We also have the option of making him looking at someone he's conspiring against. All right, so he definitely looks intelligent here. Oh, I love this one. Oh, come to mama. I love this one. Definitely looks like a jerk up to something about to betray the king. He just got news, the king just got news of something he did, and he's going to be pretending like he didn't do anything, or had nothing to do with it, or, you know how they are, those villains. Alright, and then finally I'm just going to clean up that soft brush mess you had. Really didn't benefit from it at all. The earring really wouldn't be that illuminated, it's inside the hood, so... Don't force it. Okay. And then I'm just cleaning up the rest. Oops. So what was the biggest change I made for this piece? If you could list it as one basic, one or two basic fundamentals. What are the biggest changes I made? And I'll show you the before and after in a second. I love the bone structure. Very, very devious bone structure. Oops. And we're just using some contrast to bring his face out from the seam. And just take a look at how everything is rounding off. So what are the ba major fundamentals I applied today that made these changes happen? Bit of a long class and we're not even done yet. Sorry if the class is too long, you guys. Kind of a good way for me to make up for all the cancellations recently, eh? Okay, and then... Just continuing cleaning that up. So, edges, desaturation, and cooler color expression changed to more intelligent plotting. Beautiful. So, the conspirator, the insurgent. It's good to have a, a label sometimes when you're trying to round down or, or, or corner your mood board. Because if you're thinking villain, you're thinking of too many. And I showed a lot in the brief. Those were a lot of villains I showed. So, you want to, you know, figure out what your what you're going for exactly in the nature of the character. Okay. So 
um, just doing some last minute cleaning. I like the framing that you did, but it feels a little bit um, too much soft brush doing. Uh, I, I wouldn't go for a lattice quite like this one. This looks decorated. This looks like a hall room. So remember the story, uh, like the hall, like the throne room. Um, if the story is a little different than this, if it's more um, him visiting a prisoner or something like that, you need to kind of decide what what your background, as little of it as you have, is going to help. How is it going to help the character? So before... He looks like he's thinking. Kind of just looks like an old guy, to be honest. Interpreted as a villain very easily. Where here, he really is reading as a villain. And one thing you can do to make him more scar-like, he kind of looks like a human scar, doesn't he? Is grab that baby. Grab that eyebrow. The beautiful thing about old men is their eyebrows do all kinds of wonderful things. And they're just so much fun to draw. So... Throwing in like a little thing like that. I mean, what is that? But what works? Um, figuring out how you're going to, I don't know, like uh, what, where you're going to bring in that triangle shape. So I'm, I'm loving this little weirdness in the eyebrow, that little point here. Very scar-like. And then this last one over there to complete that almost owl-like expression to him. I'm loving all of these. They're so wonderful. They have so much potential, but I hope you guys understand that the critique isn't so much kind of demeaning your creative effort, but it's definitely a compliment um, in the direction where it is cinematically perfect, and it's perfect for cinema. It's perfect for telling the story so that it'll read as much as possible, and that's what they do that's what creative directors do. That's what they do for movies. They try to make a scene read as much as possible before they jump into the next one. At least well-made stuff. Uh, so not everything, just because it's published, means it's well-made. Let us move on. So this is a rat king. And he kind of looks like a manic zombie. He doesn't see a rat priest. I think it's really cool that he has rats but those look like dogs not rats so I I don't know why you called him a rat priest am I wrong did you call him a rat priest or is this just me being a dumbass <clears throat> so I, I I love what we're seeing He kind of looks like someone who's lost his mind he's smiling he looks a little bit intelligent but I don't feel afraid of him Outside of ghoul, which is you're always going to fear factor when you're drawing a straight up monster. So that's very two dimensional. So when you're, when you're drawing a straight up monster, what happens? Ew, gross, nasty. If I see that at night, I'll probably piss my pants type stuff. How about real fear? Fear for your life that makes you, that, that infects you over time. That's a real amazing villain. A villain that is unpredictable. A villain like Sticky Fingers, <laughs> who is works over time works with so which which kind of villain villain are you going for in your design and this can go for any character is it the kind that takes his time or is it the kind that's a straight-up monster ugh, and scares you uh, kind of like a straight-up freak show no apologies just out there to freak people out really two-dimensional six season uh, a, a villain for the protagonist to be busy with before the finale something something really basic a time consumer so what can he have on his person? What can he be carrying? What can he be looking at? What else can be in the scene that is making him more crazy? So if he's a priest, what do people do around priests? People gather around priests. So let's, let's work this. Let's work on this. Um, so people gather around priests. So he could have a swarm of what? Zombies, people listening to his sermon about rats and they're kind of like crazy mummified people listening to him all right so then he'd really feel like a priest so these are all the people in the foreground kind of just listening to what he's saying crap i should have made this in a new layer okay and they're just listening to him zombies from all around people he's killed people he's risen from the grave 
that we're all just gathered. Okay, so we'll add a couple more. And then, what else does a priest have? A priest is ordained, so I would darken the top. Look at what this beautiful, simple, simple gra gradient tool. You put it on the second setting so it's not uh, opaque. Simple gradient tool has done so much for all of my critiques today. So just remember that darkening one corner does a lot. And it's just the G. And what I'm going to do is erase as a spotlight. So I'm going to make him feel like he's ordained, but with a little bit of light. But obviously he's not ordained by any goddamn thing. He's just a monster. But he's intelligent enough to have kind of brought all these people out from the grave. And he's uh, invited them. So what else is happening? I'm going to try to complete this spotlight on him a little bit more. So I'm giving him a bit more compositional importance, throwing the corners off into darkness. What else does a monster like this do? So I'm going to throw in, I mean, has he killed people or has he just risen people? Does he have a magical element to him? He probably does. So let's make his eyes, let's go for the ghoul. So we've looked at a lot of three-dimensional villains so far. We really haven't drawn a full-on monster yet. That first girl we looked at, she is kind of a monster, though. So we did have that. But something as simple as this goes a very, very long way. It kind of looks like a magic card now as soon as I did that. And I'm just going to zoom out for this decision. That's fine. <clears throat> and uh, I feel like these are some of the elements missing. If you were going to go for monster, go for it. Where's the blood? Where's the gore? Um, uh, he kind of doesn't look like he's in charge. So how do we make him look like he's in charge? Well, one thing that makes villains or anyone look in charge is jewelry or some kind of important artifact of some kind that they're carrying on them and this could be a, a tool that looks like this it could be a necklace or some kind of amulet that glows in a very very similar way to how his eyes glow so the reason he's reanimated and i've been reading garth nick's um keys to the kingdom so i'm kind of like really all over necromancers right now but this could be something that helps you illustrate, illustrate, like kind of depict, you know, where his power is coming from. This is a very basic placeholder. You don't have to make it glow all the way around. You can invest some design, some religion, like the seven pointed star or something like that. Okay. And that'll help you again, complete the scene. Other stuff that you need, which is why I said, crap, I should have drawn these guys on a separate um, thing is uh, because the fog, fog is wonderful. <laughs> fog is great. Uh, so what we want to do, I don't have my Matt's painting, Matte painting brush set on me right now, but I'm going to try to throw that fog in to separate the ghouls from what's around him. So if he is a rat king, where is, where is the swarm or the rat priest? Where is the swarm of, of, of rats. Where is that? And I'm going to try to make this fog billow around him. The background behind him is just a bit too bright, I think. And then I'm going to try to delete that where I had my little fellas here, these little zombies. So his expression is wonderful, but I feel like we have one thing missing in his expression. He he when when whenever you've seen someone a priest like speak to a public, very impassioned, very very moved. So I'm going to give him an eyebrow that looks a bit desperate. And that's the desperation when we're in love, with desperation, all of that when we're moved, when we're emotional. He kind of looks like he's making love, you know. <laughs> 
This guy is getting it on. Ew, ew, disgusting. Oh god, now I imagined. Never mind. Um, so, so I'm gonna try to give him an eyebrow like that. But what we're doing, we're raising the arc all the way up to uh, to keep him evil. Always zooming. Look at that expression that we got. We got all this expression coming out of him now. Kind of looks a little bit mourning, like he died for, he died unjustly. Maybe he's in love with someone. Maybe someone didn't want him. Maybe he was the chef, fell in love with the queen, got rejected, something, I don't know. Okay. So we have a bit more activity, and this is this is a fun type of ghoul to make. This is the classic monster villain, right? The monster is the villain sometimes, which is two-dimensional, but us giving him a desperate eyebrow made him a bit more three-dimensional. So before, not much going on. We filled the scene with something that describes what he's doing. Another thing that a priest holds, obviously, is a book, so... Maybe he's holding a, a, a scroll of some kind. Maybe he, he is holding a book right now. That's what he's reading from. So he's holding the scroll here. The scroll is held this way and it's kind of unraveled and he's holding it from one side. And he's just reading the scripture or whatever it is. And the people around him are listening. Okay, that's one way that... Um, you could make him look like a monster. Uh, one big thing with villains, unless he's got a great dental plan, he's gonna lose some teeth. So making him... <laughs> My jokes suck. <laughs> I really have started to joke like a dad, like a, I've really started to joke like an older professor or teacher. <laughs> okay, um... So maybe a couple of missing teeth to make him look more zombie-like. Of course, more detail on those surrounding zombies. And you have yourself an illustration. So <clears throat> honorable mentions. Let's look at these because um, I really do have to go now. Uh, so we've got the Thorn King. You've designed a king of thorns. He looks like a bit of Sar Sauron without a mask on. He does look like a villain. He, he, he does seem like a powerful warrior god type villain. He is not reading as a thorn king, though. Where are the thorns? Uh, apart from the Sauron crown, he really isn't looking like a thorn king. I love the description. Um, and then we have uh, this one here, a little bit similar to what we had earlier. But I guess this is her assistant. She's waking someone up from the dead. Maybe this is the person she's waking up. She does not look like a villain. She does not look like someone who's dabbled in necromancy. Um, darker circles. She's kind of let go a lot of her beauty. If she's a, a witch that cared about her beauty, she'd be using some kind of, I don't know, sex magic. She's going to want to live forever and look youthful. So someone who's con who wants to look youthful, why? Because beauty is power. So she's using that beauty to get more money, more wealth, more admiration, more, like, I don't know, sex from people. So she's not really going to care so much about her beauty if her power that she's pursuing has nothing to do with beauty, which is control over death and life. She probably cares less about how she looks and more about her actual power, what she wields. What's the story? Why is she so driven? So I wouldn't put so much beauty in her face at all. I would make her face look like she spent hours and hours, sacrificed her own vitality to become this powerful, being able to do this, whatever she's doing. So that's how you're making us, that's how you make a successful villain. You sacrifice some areas so that you can push forth other units of the design that read really, really well, that, that will read well, that will actually make a more synced, uh, like a, um, a trinity between the costume, the expression, and the portrait and the expression, and the gesture. Gestures are really good today. Um, so this guy here, he looks like a, he, he looks like a, kind of looks like a Disney movie now, doesn't it? Um, he, he looks like, he's very symmetrical, very stiff. Um, though this isn't the one we edited. Um, this one here, very distorted and crazy, out of control. 
Um, then we've got this one here, kind of like a peaceful sermon, but at the same time, obviously not peaceful at all, and that he's bringing back the dead, probably in necromancy as well. And then we've got a gesture here. The gesture here was pretty stiff, but I like that head tilt. It was doing a lot for the scene. Um, she just didn't look powerful. She didn't look like someone who was sitting on a throne. Um, you guys did wonderfully. I might do a continuation of today for Thursday just so that if there's more people handing stuff in, people inspired by today, they end up finishing it really quickly and handing it in by Thursday. Um, we can definitely um, continue there. But thank you everyone for those who handed stuff in. I really appreciate it. I almost didn't do a class today because I wasn't feeling all that well, but um, I really hope that these limitations that I've had recently kind of, you know, I, I, I get over them and uh, we move on uh, and we continue with regular streams um, and regular uh, uh, community challenges. So last minute announcements, please make sure that you are commenting on the post I will make by the end of this week, um, calling in topics for our next community challenge. Uh, Portrait Studio will be on sale June 1st, starting on the 31st of May, so you have a bit of time. If you don't know what Portrait Studio, Portrait Studio is, go to my website and um, go to the store and click on the Portrait Studio uh, item and scroll down and just watch this. I talk a lot about what goes into making Portrait Studio, what it is, how I've used it in the past. Um, it's a reference generation software that um, uh, Abu and I developed and really, really put a lot into it. It helps you build references, both educational and uh, for drafting. So um, if you guys want to buy that, it will be available on sale 50% in a month uh, for two weeks. And the price does go back up because these sales are synced with massive overhaul updates. The UI is completely changed. It's, it's, it's changed for the better. I know you've just gotten used to using Purchase Studio's new UI. But these changes are healthy, these changes are good, it means our team is on it. So welcome these changes, and I promise with every major change, Abu will make a tutorial video explaining what's been changed and what's been added and how to use it. There will always be a tutorial slash trailer for any Porsche Studio changes. Um, if you enjoyed today, as you know, I don't have any sponsorships and I don't work in that, in that kind of way with my channel. So if you want to support what I do, you can go to Patreon and uh, support me there. Um, and you can join as for the educational benefit or just as a watcher. If all of us watched on my channel for a dollar a month, then obviously we, wouldn't, we, would, we would never have a hard day for the rest of our lives. Um, so if anyone, if everyone is, is uh, joining as a watcher, um, it helps a lot. At least it helps curb Patreon fees. Um, thank you everyone for watching. I will see you guys on Thursday. Hopefully, fingers crossed, I'll feel better by then. Um, at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Look out for my announcements on Facebook. Please join and like the page. I, I contact you guys a lot through there. I, I'm trying to get on Instagram. I will uh, announce on Reddit before every stream. I'm trying to post from my phone on YouTube because you can do that, like little posts and events. And then, of course, I have Twitter um, to post there as well. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I will see you guys on Thursday, hopefully. Bye.